Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NovaCast, episode number five, with my friend Corey Diedrich here from IP Tech. Corey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Josh. Sure thing. Um, you are very well versed in the AGV AMR world, so we are excited to talk all things, uh, you know, around that today. It's you know something that we hear a lot out in the field, or that I hear when I'm out on these sales trips. Is you know, once we sell a palletizer, they say, okay, now what do I do with it? Right. You, a lot of people are waiting on forklifts, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's kind of a natural progression. And I think uh, our worlds kind of collide a lot. So glad to have you on and glad to have this this topic for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to discuss. Yeah. So I think let's, you know, we'll dive right in. We'll get started. First, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you've been with IP Tech for like seven years. Kind of go through, you know, how you got to where you are and, you know, even IP Tech as a company. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just give a little context or background of myself. Um, I'm originally from Wisconsin, uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a mechanical engineering degree and uh, decided it was a good time to just get out of the cold Midwest. Um, so we kind of landed on Colorado. Um, my wife and I and the opportunity arose to uh, work at IP Tech as an applications engineer. So doing system sizing for uh, automation customers and automation projects. So. Uh, you know, kind of started out in the more on the technical side um, and did that for a couple of years until I had the opportunity to uh, more or less leap into sales. Um, so it's kind of an unplanned, uh, unplanned path. But um, I've been in uh, kind of an outside facing sales role as a sales engineer ever since. Um, and then just a little bit of background about IP tech or in position technologies. Uh, we're a motion control robotics and automation distributor. So. You know, we work with uh, machine builders. Uh, we work with, uh, you know, end, end customers and manufacturers to help them solve their automation problems and automation challenges. So, Awesome. Well, thanks for the background. Uh, cool that you're from Wisconsin. I don't think I knew that. Um, <laughs> Zach Toma, who was on this podcast uh, earlier, I think episode two or three, he's, he's a regional sales manager for Kawasaki. He is uh, from out that way as well. I think okay. Wisconsin, Iowa. Um but, you know, I always joke with anyone from Wisconsin, it's like you've got that um, that IPA, um, what is it, spotted cow. You know, you can't yep. go anywhere else. So Yeah, you can't um, miss it. <laughs> yeah. I spent some time in the uh, the Northwoods League back, I don't know, like 10 years ago. So whenever we're in Wisconsin, you know, everybody's like, oh, you got to get the spotted cow. But yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> spotted cow and cheese curds, that's what, that's what Wisconsin is known for. So it's does that make you a Packers fan then too? Yeah, I'm actually from Green Bay originally. So yeah. Oh, wow. Big, there you big go. Fan. <laughs> so are you a Green Bay Bullfrogs fan too? Because that's their that's their Northwoods League team. <laughs> yeah, they've changed uh, it many many times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, oh man, cool. Well, I'm a Vikings fan, so we won't get into that then. Ah, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, well, we're both sitting out here watching the Lions. So. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. A little bit more exciting for you guys, though. I think uh, you got a good quarterback there. It's not fair to yeah. go from you know Favre to Rodgers to now Jordan Love, who. <laughs> You know, except for that last throw of his season looked pretty great. So Yeah. Yep. I'll <laughs> uh, give you that one. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I had to get one in. So all right, let's dive back into the the AGV AMR discussion. So I know that you guys work a lot with Mir. Um, you know, we actually had one of your um, you know, Mir robots uh at PacX this past year, mm -hmm. um, which was pretty cool. So kind of dive in, you know, if this is someone who has no idea what an AGV or an AMR is, but you know, they're excited by the idea of, you know, not having to um, worry about hiring more forklift drivers, right? Um, you know, that's sure. sometimes a problem that, that companies face, and especially like big logistics companies, right? They've got forklifts flying all over the place. Um, you know, kind of dive into the, the best use cases that you see, and then a little bit of the difference between AGVs and AMRs. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the biggest question or, I mean, the main reason why, you know, people come to us or we're talking about AGVs or AMR solutions is, um, you know, just simple fact of there's a lot of uh, resources and money put into moving a product from point A to point B in a facility. Um, you know, there, you know, it tends to when you've got a fleet of forklift drivers driving around all day, um, you start to look at, you know, hey, how, how can we optimize and be a little bit more efficient with our facility? Um, that's typically kind of the starting point of, you know, a lot of those conversations of how can we make our facility more efficient and streamline some of these material transport processes. Um, so I guess, uh, maybe to take, take a step back and talk about AGVs and AMRs, um, AGVs have been around for a very long time. 
Uh, traditionally, they've been used uh, quite heavily in the automotive industry. Uh, so uh, for, for those that don't know the difference between AGVs and AMRs, AGVs are typically following a magnet strip or a, um, a wire that's embedded in the floor or reflectors in the facility. Um, and basically just following a line around a uh, facility. So if there is something in its way, it's gonna basically stop until that object is out of its path and then continue on its way. Um, most of the times you don't wanna get in its way because it's on a, it's on a beeline from <laughs> point A to point B and, and it's, uh, its intent is to get there as, as fast and efficiently as possible. Um, so more, more recently, AMRs have kind of taken a, a bigger, uh, bigger play in the automated material handling uh, space. And um, the, the main difference between AGVs and AMRs is that AMRs are using LIDAR, typically using LIDAR technology to navigate and map and localize itself within an environment. Um, so traditionally, you're not, um, you're not as fixed to, say, an, an AGV solution where you're following a line. Um, you can uh, use its mapping and localizing to navigate around objects that come into its path, for instance. Uh, so it does give you a lot more flexibility, um, as well as if your facility does change, which in a manufacturing environment, things are always changing, always in flux. Uh, so it does give you the ability to change routes or change as needed. Um, so it does give you a lot more flexibility in that respect. Yep. And then, you know, I like how you kind of explained the differences there. Cause I just talked to someone yesterday who, you know, was, was saying that they had the magnet, you know, strips on the ground and, and all of that. So, and they had no idea about the LIDAR, you know, and that I felt excited to tell them about it because I had talked to you before. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that's, that is one cool thing for sure. And, and there are a lot of objections, right, that I'm sure that you deal with, just like, you know, I deal with on the palletizing side, right? But what are mm -hmm. some of the common objections that you have to deal with or, you know, specifically around safety? You know, one of the, the questions that I get asked a lot, um, which to me is kind of funny, is, you know, we have this this mobile palletizing cell, the MPC-80, that we had at, at PACX. And it palletizes on the left. When the left is finished, it goes and palletizes on the right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go in there and you break that, you know, you break the line, robot shuts down, right? But if someone's on the left side and it's palletizing on the right, you know, you can restart it and it doesn't, that pallet area is a dead area, right? If somebody's standing on the left pallet, that, that's a dead area, right? Yep. Um, and people ask that question, well, what if that happens? Well, you know, that's not necessarily, you know, the the responsibility of the system, right? That's more so a an operator error. You know, because you got some guy in there saying, hey, I'm just cleaning up something on this side. You can go ahead and start it. I'll be out of here before it gets on onto the mm -hmm. other side. Um, and obviously there's, you know, other safety concern, you know, safety considerations you can make. You can add more area scanners. You can have even, you know, thermal, um, you know, safety scanners, things like that. But, you know, yeah. that's what drives cost up, right? So on your side, I would imagine some of the questions are like, hey, I saw one of these and it knocked over, you know, a bunch of racks in this logistics company or, mm -hmm. you know, I, this one ran over this person or stuff like that. How do you kind of, what are some of the objections that you see and then how do you handle those? Yeah, so from the safety aspect, um, I think, you know, just around the topic of, hey, we've got this robot and it's driving around. Um, there's got to be some safety concerns with it. Um, so a lot of these systems are uh, capable and have a lot of safety functions built in. So um, not only are, uh, in this case, AMR is using LIDAR for mapping and navigating throughout its environment, but it's also monitoring everything around it. So static and dynamic objects. So if there are people approaching the robot, for instance, if it's carrying a pallet, it's monitoring any traffic coming towards it. Uh, the faster that person or object is moving towards it, it's going to monitor that and potentially, you know, throw itself into a safety stop or reduce its speed just so it's not running into any uh, collisions or obstacles in that respect. Um, uh, a lot of these will have extra sensors too, like 3D sensors, you know, monitoring objects on the ground or potentially above the robot. Obviously, you don't want, you know, a robot driving, trying to drive underneath a, a pallet rack with a pallet on top of it um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, 
so you know a lot of that safety is built in and it's it, it's tied into a safety plc that's on board the robot um to make sure that if it does run into a, a potential issue with the collision it's going to enter a e-stop mode um and a lot of these systems will have e-stop buttons on them so it'll require if somebody does hit the e-stop you know you'll have to do basically a a, a, re a manual restart on that unit uh, with a key um, so you can't physically restart it or um, restart it somewhere else uh, off-site without it being physically restarted. Sure. So there are a lot of safety checks in place and, and follow a lot of those safety standards. I think, um, you know, some of the reason why we, some of these conversations do start with customers is actually uh, because of incidents in their facilities. So people running into, uh, running forklifts into racking or equipment, yep. uh, which is, you know, the other side of it. It's a, you know, there's a safety concern there with trying to meet, um, you know, your your material de deliveries as fast as possible. Kind of, I've been in a lot of facilities where forklifts are whipping around and you got to be, you got to have your head on a yep. swivel. Um, <laughs> so it kind of goes both ways on, on that side for sure. Um, I actually was just talking to a guy today and he, um, he just had a couple incidents with a, a one of his forklift drivers. They drove into a piece of their equipment, and now they're having to basically, you know, set everything back up again. And and uh, so it, you know, downtime is is downtime. So um, yeah. especially from the safety aspect, you know, anytime you're running into people or objects in the facility, that's a huge safety concern. Um, yeah. But I think um, as far as kind of other obje objections we run into, um, a lot this technology is you know it's it's still I, I wouldn't say we're at bleeding edge uh, anymore. Um, back when I started with with IP Tech, we, we were certainly kind of on the bleeding edge and had a lot of companies that were interested in it and willing to uh, do put a little R and D effort into it. Um, but you know that being said. Um, yeah, it's just a, a, a new technology to develop um, and kind of getting that um, buy off and that idea to implement these in your facility. Sometimes it does take a little bit of culture shift and culture change uh, to accept that type of technology. Um, yep. So that's usually one of the big ones too is how are my people going to work with or see this robot as a value add versus a, a, a competitor in that situation. Yeah. Um, and I think the last thing, you know, we do work with small, large companies alike. Um, a lot of these conversations do boil down to, you know, cost of systems and how can we justify it? Um, you know, because they, they tend to be, you know, fairly, pricey systems. So it has to be, you know, justified with typically a couple shifts or there has to be a major issue with um, one customer reached out to us and they were actually looking at it more from a um, uh, staffing issue with moving materials. So they were having two or three people on a move at a time, which, you know, that's quite expensive when you, when you look at it, in the overall cost of moving materials. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things we we certainly run into on uh, um, on some of the objections of of systems, but yeah, yep. And it seems like everybody's got a story, right? At at the plant, you know, somebody had an experience with it or has seen something, and you know, it's kind of the blessing and the curse, right? You've got four or five guys, or you know, four or five um, people at the facility who are really excited about it, but you mm -hmm. might have that one that one person there who's like, "Well, this robot did this, right?" And I run into that too. On, on yep. my side of things, but, um, but yeah, I'm sure it's getting easier and easier for you to have those safety discussions as technology continues to advance. Right. I mean, it's got to, I would imagine has come a long way since, you know, since you started. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, we're, we're typically out in front of customers and we'll, we'll do demos for them because a lot of times seeing is believing, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. one thing to say, Hey, this, this robot will stop. And it's another thing to jump out in front of it and, and know it's going to stop. So, yeah. <laughs> Test yeah, I guess yourself. that was probably one of your uh, <laughs> your biggest risks as a as a salesman early on in this process, right? You got to throw yourself in front of some moving robots to yep to you know, prove that it works. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Well, yeah, and and I think one of the things too is that that would be helpful is you know for someone listening to this, they 
you know, might be getting really excited and thinking, oh, this could be great for our plant. What are kind of your, your big, um, you know, reasons or, you know, big, big things that you look for when you're on, say you're on a sales call, right. And you're walking through mm-hmm. a plant and you say, okay, this is a good fit. Um, what are those things that you look for and what are sort of the milestones that plants need to meet in order to, you know, make this work, right? I know you said multiple shifts helps, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah. How do you walk into a plant and say, okay, this is, this can work uh, versus going into a plant and saying, oh, you know what, they're a few years off. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, always a, a juggle and balancing act. Um, every, every company is at a different point on when they want to adopt technology um, or if they can even justify it. Um, a lot of, a lot of times we'll try to vet out uh, customers and customer projects up front. So just get an idea of, okay, what are your internal logistics look like? What are you guys moving around? Um, are you just simply moving, you know, carts of material uh, for like water spider actions or, or you know, smaller material deliveries to assembly lines? Or are you looking more at, you know, larger pallet handling or pallet uh, movement throughout your facility? Um, and then kind of getting a sense of what does that look like? So uh, how many lines do you have? You know, how many runs or pallets are you guys building up a day? Where is material going? Do you have inbound material coming in that needs to feed the lines? Um, and just kind of getting a better understanding of what does their internal logistics look like and breaking it down into, okay, this, this might be your lowest hanging fruit. Let's try to tackle this first. Everything else might be a nice to have, but at the end of the day, you got to try to make it, you know, easily justified without, uh, blowing up the scope of the project too much where, you know, it's kind of the 80, 20 rule. Um, you know, if you try to automate a hundred percent of everything, it, you end up with a, you know, a million dollar price tag. So, yeah. Um, so trying to find a good balance there, but yeah, typically, you know, what we're looking at when we go on site is, um, you know, pain points from the customer. Are there, have there been safety issues in past? Um, do they have many people driving forklifts around? Do they have people driving forklifts into areas where they maybe don't want forklift traffic? Um, and, um, yeah, so I mean, just kind of looking at a lot of different aspects of what they see as a as a fit solution in their facility. Yeah, and are there, you know, looking at kind of what you all offer, right? For me, it's easy to say, okay, the the good fit there is to, you know, palletize directly on, um, you know, on say a mirror, right? And then mm-hmm. when it's done, the the mirror comes pulls in into the pallet rack, takes the pallet away, takes it off to the wrapper or to a shipping station. What is your most, you know, maybe detailed solution, right? Do you have anything that, you know, starts from truck unloading and then ends with truck loading? Um, you know, what what kind of uh, end-to-end, what's your end-to-end solution look like? So most of the a, time, sense. yeah, most of the time somebody's looking for end-to-end. That's definitely not our wheelhouse. Um, there are some companies out there that do that, but those can be, you know, fairly comp- complex solutions. You're dealing with a lot of different stages. You know, if you're getting product off, directly off of a truck and then you're bringing it to uh, racking, um, you, maybe you've got a high bay loader or you're stacking pallets, bringing it to your manufacturing line, uh, end of line back to your shipping or your warehousing. Um, what we try to boil it down to is let's let's break down everything you're looking at again kind of going back to the 80 20 rule and let's just look at where would you get your most payback with material handling so uh if we notice that you know someone is spending a majority of their time doing a long back and forth travel all day on a forklift or with a pallet jack um, those are the areas that we want to go after because those are going to be the most simplified tasks where you're just doing a point to point move. Um, and then that, you know, that 20% can be handled once that pallet or that material is delivered to, uh, your, your destination. Um, so relying more on just kind of el- eliminating some of that transfer time, because that's in, in, in an essence, non-value added time and it adds uh, cost to the product. Yep. And I actually think we've talked about this before, but um, just for the sake of the podcast, there are, you know, people who say, you know, they want to say, Hey, um, AMR, go get this, this pallet off of, you know, level six of the rack. Right. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and they would love for that to go up there and then, you know, fly up, then come back down, then take it to, you know, wherever they're, you know, wherever they need it. Um, Mm -hmm. and then also, you know, pick it up out, you know, once it's palletized, stuff like that. Is that something that you're seeing become more and more popular in like logistics warehouses where they're asking for solutions that can, you know, kind of go up and grab, um, product from, from the racks? It's, it's definitely an ask every single time. Um, yep. when it comes to having an actual conversation about it, those, those solutions can be, uh, you know, very expensive, uh, similar to ASRS systems, uh, where you have to have, you know, dedicated infrastructure. Um, and at the end of the day, sometimes it just doesn't necessarily make sense, or they're just not quite there yet to make the leap on, on those types of solutions, or it's just maybe a little bit too complex. Um, so we have to take a step back and just look at you know, a good, a better starting point. Um, Cause you're kind of going with a solution like that, you are going qu- quite far into the deep end. Um, so trying to break yep. it down into baby steps is always uh, the approach we like to take and, and uh, try to push as well, especially with yep. a customer that's very, very new to uh, automation. Um, even like, you know, warehouses or distribution centers, traditionally not a whole lot of automation there uh, manufacturing a little bit different, but, with a new technology like this, um, you know, it's definitely something you, you want to be careful you're doing it right the first time. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that, that impacts future projects too, right. Or just automation in general. So, yep. um, you know, I'm sure you hear that a lot. Well, we tried automation and you know, this <laughs> happened or, you know, it, and a lot of it depends on who's actually at the plant. Right. So do you come in, come across that as well? Like, are there, you know, maybe an, not necessarily an internal champion, but like, you know, for our systems, you know, it's great if there's a, a really good operator, right? Somebody who knows the machine, um, you know, yeah, maybe two or three people don't have to hand stack anymore, but you still kind of need that one person who can, you know, run that machine and know the, know the machine inside and out. And that makes a big difference. Is that similar on your end, kind of someone who knows the ins and outs of, of your products and, um, you know, can, can be there and, make sure that downtime is, you know, 20 minutes instead of, you know, two days. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's always crucial. Um, you know, you always want to have somebody on staff that knows a thing or two. Uh, you don't have to be an expert by any means, but someone that's willing to own it and just make sure it's, it's going to go as smooth as possible. So like in that case where you do have an issue, they can get it up and running quicker than, you know, a, you know, a day or two. So because yep. downtime cool. is 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 king, especially in manufacturing. Oh, so yeah. yep. if you can eliminate that, that's it's the best case scenario. Yep, exactly. How about the life of these um, you know, these AMRs? How long, you know, say someone, you know, deploys a fleet of AMRs today, how long can they expect those AMRs to to continue running, right? I know it's probably mm-hmm. hard to sit here and say, oh, they'll run for 15 years because, you know, they haven't been around for 15 years. So, right. um, yeah. you know, what, what do you kind of tell people when they're asking those questions? Yeah. So typically um, a lot of the components uh, are, are typically sized for about four to five years of operation. Um, and that's assuming that you've got it, you know, running, running consistent, you know, full days. Um that being said, you know, I mean, I'm sure you could get definitely more life out of it, depending on, you know, how you're using them or how, uh, how you're abusing them. Um, yep. so the, the harder you're running them, yeah, you can, you can still expect your four to five year payback, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it does come down to your use case too. What are you handling? How much payload? Yeah. You know, how often are you running it? Things like that. So yeah. cool. And then how about integration with other. Um, you know, other products or other, you know, other machines, right? You know, talk a little bit about kind of the options on the palletizing side. You know, I, I liked mm-hmm. how, how you brought a lot of those to the table when we were talking about PacX in, in that demo, you know, with the pallet rack or, um, you know, the the conveyor on top that moves like the roller conveyor that can roll right onto it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, talk a little bit about those options. Yeah, so uh, specifically talking about MIR, um, so for those who don't know, MIR, M-I-R, uh, Mobile Industrial Robots is what that stands for. Um, they basically have uh, platform-style robots. Um, so in the most typical scenario for some of the larger robots, we would see a uh, pallet lift. Um, so what the robot does is it drives underneath a pallet rack where a, a pallet would be sitting on top of a rack. 
and then raises a lift about an inch or so, able to lift that pallet up and then drive out of that dock bay um, and drive on to its final destination and drop it off. Uh, so that's the most common for um, you know pallet handling. Um, we do have customers that do uh, have sh internal shelves that are circulated. Um, so just same kind of concept. Uh, you'd have a shelf lift where the robot's picking up a shelf and driving around with those parts. Um, we, we have seen uh, situations where um, customers want to offload pallets with powered rollers onto uh, gravity fed outfeed conveyor or for staging purposes or uh, feeding a pallet onto the robot. Um, so there's, you know, uh, powered conveyor options that on that side. Um, and then surprisingly, we've, we've actually seen um, customers put pallets on top of just um, wheeled racks and just tow them from station A to station B. And once it gets there, somebody with a forklift would just pull it off the cart and they just use that as kind of a, a recirculating mechanism in their facility. So definitely a lot of different ways you can kind of, uh, you know, make it work in your facility. And um, I'll, I'll say, you know, every customer is a little bit different and there's no, um, I, I would like to say there's a, oh yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is how you guys will do it every single time. But um, there's a lot of different options that come into play, um, you know, and, and some things just work better for different customer environments. So it, it's kind of case by case on what's the best fit for it for a yeah. end user application. And I, I liked how you mentioned, you know, the, you know, the AMRs interacting with, with forklifts, right? So what does that look like in, you know, maybe a logistics environment or, you know, a customer that you have that maybe has, has bought a couple of these, but isn't all in on it yet. Right. Sure. Um, how do the, you know, the mirrors or whatever AMR you're using interact with other forklifts? I mean, do they know who has the right of way? You know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what does yeah, that You don't want to like? be kind of dancing in a, in an aisle. Yep. Fighting over stuck in a four-way stop. Yeah. You don't know who's going to go, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, most of the time when you're you're programming or setting these uh, robots up, you'll typically give them a dedicated aisle way, um, similar to like a manufacturing environment. If you did have forklift traffic, typically you'd have it on a dedicated side of your aisle and then foot traffic on, let's say, the left-hand side. Um, so similar, similar idea, you'd always give... Um, always have the robot move towards a, you know, dedicated AMR traffic uh, section. And then if it did have to navigate around a pallet or an obstacle in the way, you could certainly give it the option to do so. Uh, but it would always tend to stay to that preferred path. Um, that way you don't have any, you know, situations where you, you've you got, you know, we're, we're not sure which way we're going to go with the uh, forklift operator. So. Sure. And then how about like, you know, the control side of things or deployment side of things where, you know, someone's looking at this and they say, Oh, you know, this is going to be a great fit for us. What is that timeline like from the moment someone says, yeah, Corey, I'd love to get a fleet of AMRs in here um, to the time that, you know, your, your fleets up and running. Depends on, it's going to be, be somewhat of a vague answer, but uh, it really depends on how many robots we're talking about in the scope of the project. Um, if it's a fairly simple pickup and drop off, you know, maybe you're looking at a couple months to deploy and get dialed in and tuned in. Realistically, um, you can have the robot running product, you know, within a couple weeks um, and yeah. be well dialed. And are you in. just teaching it? You know, similar to how a robotic arm would would palletize. You know, you're, you're sort of teaching the the path. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, just to kind of maybe back up um, the the programming for, let's say, Mir, for instance, um, what you essentially what you do is you you get get the robot in and you immediately start to map your facility. So, what you do is put it in mapping mode and you're just driving it around into the areas that uh, you'd have it navigating, um, and it's using all the lidar data to essentially build a map of your facility. So, once you've got that map built out. Um, then you can start editing and putting in um, different pickup drop-off locations, um, different weight points, um, maybe put your charging stations in. So I, by the time mm -hmm. you have the, you know, the kind of the map all put together and edited, yeah, it's, it's as simple as if you've got drop-off stations, you can edit them in the map and change the places you need it to go and set up your uh, missions to call it to 
uh, different stations or send it to different places. Cool. And then obviously that's probably something you have to do every time you put a new piece of equipment in or, you know, you do something to the floor space, right? Sort of yeah, have to reteach I, the... I, ideally, keeping an updated map is, is um, you know, preferred. Uh, typically what mm -hmm. we recommend customers to do is if they have static known features, um, yep. when, you're, when you're setting up and mapping the robot, um, you go you can go back into the map and clean it up in like a paint editor and take out a lot of your dynamic objects that let's say if you had a row of pallets that were sitting off to the side when you're mapping, you can take all that data out. So you have some of that static data that the robot can then um, use for its localization when it's, you know, navigating its map. Yep. And is that part of kind of the, the, you know, the recommended upkeep, so to speak, you know, Cause it's funny hearing you say that cause it's, you know, a lot of times we'll get a DWG file uh, or a CAD layout of, of a facility. Right. And usually the first thing that comes along with that is here's the CAD layout, but there's, you know, I've got to mark this up cause this isn't in there. Right. Or, you know, yep. we, we put a filler in there or something, you know, there's just all sorts of markups. Um, so is that something you try to, to tell your customers, Hey, make sure you're doing this every, every three months or every six months or something like that to kind of keep a, almost like backing up your computer or something like that. Yeah, definitely. You you definitely want to keep the map up to date for sure, especially if there's like big, big changes to your facility. But for the most part, um, you know, so long as you don't have any major changes, it's, it's fairly capable of, you know, uh, can, taking into consideration a lot of that uh, dynamic objects. Awesome. And then who's running these, you know, who's, whose responsibility is the AMR is it the plant manager. Is it a maintenance manager? Is it an operator? Who's who's kind of the your common internal champion for these uh, these systems? Yeah. So typically, with a lot of our manufacturing uh, customers, um, they'll have an uh, an engineer dedicated to this, or this will be you know a project under their scope of work. Um, so it is you know someone with a little bit more technical background that you know kind of knows the ins and outs of the programming side can work on troubleshooting or you know, kind of assist us with, you know, maybe some changes or uh, ideas that they want to implement. Um, but it typically is uh, somebody with an engineering background, but we've, I mean, we've kind of seen it all. Um, it's it's more or less, we, we just want somebody that, you know, wants to champion the project and, and wants <laughs> to, uh, you know, use the technology and, and uh, be a champion for it. Yeah, um, for sure. And then I guess last question on the AMR stuff, you know, this has been great. Um, what is the support like, you know, from your side? Are they getting support from, from you at IP Tech? Are they getting more support from me or kind of what is the, how do you, you know, make these customers feel all warm and fuzzy when they buy these, right? What's your, what's your support look like? Yeah. So we've, we've got it set up to where we're, our company IP Tech is capable of supporting our customers and we want to make sure that they are supported and successful in their deployments. Um, but in the case that, you know, there is an issue that pops up uh, and if it's something that we can't solve, Mirror is definitely a backstop and they've got a support portal to help us out and have, have done so in the past. Um, but we're typically kind of the first line of defense, like, Hey, let's, let's see if we can figure this out before we bring, bring more people into it. Uh, might be something yep. that we can quickly, uh, you know, quickly help solve. Um, and we're happy to do that. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And, uh, before I let you go, uh, one of the things that I like about this podcast or try to incorporate is, you know, we just talked for, you know, half an hour about, um, you know, relevant stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, now let's do a couple of minutes of, uh, what's Corey like outside of the, the manufacturing world. Um, you yeah. know, Van, who is on Van works for us. Uh, he's one of our sales managers. He's a, he's a big cook. There was a guy on before he's a fly fisherman. Uh, you know, just learning kind of things that you wouldn't necessarily think about someone. So what's, uh, what's Corey like to do outside yeah. of work? Yeah. So I've, uh, I've kind of entered, um, a new era in my life. I just had a kid about nine months ago. Um, so I'm kind of figuring that out myself. Uh, but for this past father's day, I had to go buy myself a, a smoker cause that seemed like the right dad thing to do. Uh, so I've recently Absolutely. taken that up and, and started that as a hobby, but, um, but yeah, outside of that, um, you know, we, we like to, my wife and I like to get out to the mountains, uh, do, you know, hiking, camping in the summertime when it's nice out. Um, yeah, that's kind of, we just like to be outdoors in the mountains and, 
and uh, enjoy the enjoy our time out in in the Colorado. So yeah, I mean, you live in a great place for it, right? And, uh, yeah. So what's the what's the specialty on the smoker? Right now, I I don't want to beat my chest, but I made a pretty good brisket last time for the first time. So oh, nice! Did you I'm wake up sure in the middle I'll... of the night to to start it. <laughs> I I, did, I cheated my way through the first one just to see if I could yeah. do it. So did it? I nice. did it half on, and then I threw it in the oven. So I won't say I'm a, awesome. I'm a pro yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And congrats on the on the new addition. Uh, yeah, being, thank you. Being a dad is awesome. I I actually just had we my wife and I we had our second son about three weeks ago. So oh well, congratulations! Had, uh, a two Thanks. and a half year old and a, and a three week old. So well, you got uh, your it's hands my first full podcast as a father of two. So no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you look yeah, like you've got awesome, some though. sleep. So. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah, every now and again, catch a nap, you know. <laughs> so, but cool. Well, thanks for joining us, Corey. Is there anything I forgot? Anything you want the world to know about AMRs? Um, you know that we didn't bring up here. No, I think this is a pretty good overview. But yeah, if anybody's got questions, feel free to reach out to Josh and I. Yeah, and let them know how they could find you. You know, you're on yeah. LinkedIn. Um, we'll, we'll link your email address um, here in the in the show notes as well. And yeah, anybody who's interested and reach out to one of us and we'll help you out. But All right. thanks for joining us, Corey. Good luck with the brisket and, uh, and fatherhood. And we'll talk soon. I'm sure. All right. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> thanks. We'll see ya. See ya. All right. That was episode five of the Novacast with Corey Diedrich. We'll be back next week with more. Thanks for joining us.